I have uh, chosen as the topic of my lecture the ethical and existential meaning of beauty. And I will uh, begin with a, a quote from my favorite poet, Rainer Maria Rilke. He writes, art is not only a selective sampling of the world. Art implies tra transforming the world, an endless modification towards the good. Beauty and ethics, as well as the relationship chips are no doubt unfashionable subjects in today's consumer society and artistic and architectural discourse. In the era that reveres appealing images and formal inventions, the ethical perspective has been pushed aside and ethical dimensions, dimension has rarely entered recent writings on art and architecture. Artistic quality is seen as a subjective and unique expression or commercial manipulation. Instead of suggesting an eth ethical resonance, arts are expected to exhibit unforeseen and unique imageries. In fact, beauty has been a problematic concept in the arts for more than a century, and artists themselves have questioned or neglected the entire notion. Finally, in our obsessive consumerist culture, beauty has turned into a deliberate aesthetic manipulation and seduction. Everything from products to environments, personality uh, and uh, behavior, and from politics to war is now manipulatively aestheticized. This implies a distinct calculated manipulation and loss of sincerity and authenticity. Beauty has turned into a means of attracting the viewer, listener, reader, instead of mediating and elevating existential experiences. Besides, today's celebrated formalist and rhetorically dramatized architecture hardly aspires for beauty or serenity as experiences of the unforeseen stunning and the unheimlich, outright imbalance and threat are frequently more apparent in its imagery. The requirement for beauty has been replaced by the obsession with newness. Paradoxically, however, also newness turns into repetitiousness and fatigue. Quote, as the new is searched only because of its newness, everything becomes identical because it has no other properties but its newness, unquote. The Norwegian philosopher Lars Svensson points out in his book, The Philosophy of Boredom. True beauty is always connected with timelessness as it turns our consciousness to permanence and eternity. Quote, the language of beauty is essentially the language of timeless reality, as philosopher Karsten Harris claims. What is the meaning of this distancing of art and architecture from beauty, ethics, and life? In his book, The Dehumanization of Art and Other Essays on Art, Culture and Literature, Jose Ortega y Gasset suggests that the subject matter of art has gradually shifted from things to sensations 
and finally to ideas. In Ortega's view, this development has gradually weakened the human content, content in art. Regardless of whether one agrees with the philosopher's analysis or not, it opens a thought-provoking view into the gradual transformation of the essence of art. This is a shift from the concrete and sensory representations to the fabricated and cognitive expressions. Art has turned autonomous and self-conscious of itself, its means and ends. At the same time, it has moved towards the realms of conceptuality and science. In this development, the role of beauty has changed accordingly, and it is difficult to relate sensory representation and phenomenal experience of beauty with the frequent cerebral and instrumentalized ideas in today's artistic expressions. Not surprisingly, these fundamental changes in artistic thinking and focus also apply in architecture. Sublime beauty was the highest aspiration of art until the end of the 19th century, but the quasi-rational and materialist culture of today regards art as a cultural deviation, an entertainment and investment. However, an interest in the connections of ethics and aesthetics, truth and beauty seems to be re-emerging again. The haunting environmental and ecological problems and the consequences of uncritical technological development, such as digitalization, artificial intelligence, and genetic manipulation, are also awaking wider ethical concerns. At the same time, the attention is shifting from the forced and noisy but mentally empty architecture of abundance to the ways of building that are emerging in the developing world, which could be called an architecture of necessity. This architecture is bound to be based on real needs, scarcities and necessities, and it is likely to be expressive of existential issues rather than isolated aesthetic intentions. In these ways of building, architectural form still arises from the materials and ways of constructing, not from detached, aestheticized elaborations and meaningless compositional complexities. True beauty in architecture is existential rather than shallowly aesthetic. Existential meanings bring us closer to the reality instead of distancing us from reality and they constitute the deepest level of experiences. While the existential meaning is disappearing from the constructions of our world of surreal wealth, the severely restricted constructions in the realities of need still mediate existential and ethical values and the aesthetics of necessity. This architecture of limits expresses the beauty of necessity in opposition to the limitless aesthetics and swiftly changing fashions of abundance. Beauty in the consumption ideology serves the forces of demand and rejection, whereas aesthetic, uh, the aesthetics of necessity give rise 
to a permanent value of aesthetic pleasure. Leonardo da Vinci's wise advice on the meaning of limits, quote, strength is born from constraints and it dies in freedom, unquote, has regrettably been forgotten. The perspective of approaching ecological, political and moral catastrophes definitely calls for a reintegration of the aesthetic and ethical sensibilities. Ecological architecture will not succeed as long as it is merely a response to regulations. It has to turn into a new desired aesthetics. At the same time, our focus needs to be shifted from the subjective, exclusive and exceptional back, exceptional back to the universal and existential concerns. The ethical function of architecture of philosopher Karsten Harris, as well as several other significant philosophical books of the past years, such as Elaine Scarry's On Beauty and Being Just, and Martha Nussbaum's Poetic Justice, also ex exemplify these concerns. Joseph Brodsky, the Nobel laureate poet, wrote frequently about the interactions of these two mental dimensions and even gave the aesthetic perception primacy. Quote, man is first an aesthetic creature before he is an ethical one, unquote. He considers our aesthetic instinct as the origin of ethical judgment. Quote, every new aesthetic reali uh, reality makes man's ethical reality more exact because aesthetics is the mother of ethics, Unquote. But for the poet, aesthetics means something more universal and autonomous than today's commercialized beauty, serving the purposes of desire, convention, consumption, and forced chains. Beauty, reason, and truth are usually seen as exclusive properties and notions, but they can well share the same mental and emotive grounding. Beauty and reason seem to be equally valid ap approaches and criteria of judgment in both science and art. Erich Fromm, philosopher and social psychiatrist, provides a striking expression of the fusion of beauty and truth when he writes, quote, beauty is not the opposite of the ugly, but of the false, end of quote. This view directly points at the interconnection of the aesthetic and ethic criteria. Aesthetic aspirations are primarily related with the world of the arts, architecture, design, and fashion, but beauty and elegance of thought are essential criteria also in mathematics, physics, and other sciences. Beauty represents comprehensive and synthetic qualities and integrities, which cannot be formalized and expressed through any other means. The experience of convincing and disarming beauty is a proof of the correctness, coherence, and inner harmony of the phenomenon. The pure beauty of the Piero della Francesca or 
Johannes Vermeer painting is likely to be beyond analysis and explanations as it penetrates every cell of the viewer. The beauty of an artwork becomes part of our existential experience and the sense of self. Indeed, beauty beautifies and ennobles our sense of self. In the view of Joseph Brodsky, a great poem projects um, a demand on the reader, quote, be like me, unquote. The poem tells the reader, internalize my beauty and make it part of your identity. Also in mathematics and sciences, especially in physics, which is a pure conceptual science, beauty is an essential criterion. The theoretical physicist Paul A. M. Dirac, one of the founders of quantum mechanics and quantum electrodynamics, argued that the theories of physics which project beauty are probably also the correct ones. Physicist Hermann Weyl, who completed the quantum and probability theories, made an even more outspoken confession. Quote, my work has always attempted to combine truth with beauty, but when I have been obliged to choose one of the two, I have chosen the beauty, end of quote. Albert Einstein associated beauty and mystery and praised the value of the mysterious. Quote, the most beautiful we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all art and science, end of quote. Today, mathematicians sometimes use the notion dirty proof in the sense of ugly, ugly proof, of a mathematical proof which has been attained through immense computing power beyond the capabilities of human perception and intellectual grasp. Today's alluring Computer renderings in architecture often make me feel that they are dirty proofs in their lack of a sense of lived life. It is evident that beauty is not an added surface value on top of an essential things as it expresses the coherence wholeness, integrity, and completeness of a thing or phenomenon. Our current culture prioritizes quantification, power, intelligence, and reason. Although emotive reactions and aesthetic intuitions are often our most synthetic modes of understanding, and beauty implies the experience of a complex entity as an in integrated singularity. Altogether, we tend to regard perceptions, skills, and understanding as processes that advance from details and parts towards entities. This simplistic idea of the dynamics of understanding is regrettably also the prevailing method of education. However, neuroscience has established that we grasp entities first, and these experiences, experienced entities give meanings to the parts. This realization shakes the accepted pedagogical elementarist foundations in a fundamental manner. 
students of art and design, for instance, should be first, should first be made to encounter real and complete works of art emotionally, and only later given detailed sensory, detailed intellectual analysis of the experienced artistic phenomena. The individual sensory experience of the work has to precede its conceptual analysis and cognitive understanding. Quote, according to the right hemisphere, understanding is derived from the whole, since it is only in the light of the whole that one can truly understand the nature of the parts. Unquote. Jan McGilchrist, therapist and philosopher, argues. Beauty is a complete judgment of a thing in the same way that we grasp the character characteristics of places and vast environmental situations such as weather through our unfocused atmospheric sense. As I enter a space, the space enters me. Quote, I enter a building, see a room, and in the fraction of a second, have this feeling about it, unquote. Peter Zumto confesses. Beauty is an immaterial experiential quality which suggests a distinct thingness, the sensuous and mental thingness of beauty. As the light artist James Tarell has argued, also light can project a thingness in our experience. Beauty, like atmosphere, is a complex experiential quality which is encountered and grasped in a synthetic, embodied, multisensory and emotional manner, rather than understood through intellectual reading. As we experience beauty, it does not remain outside of us, but becomes part of our very being. Phenomena and creatures of nature are beautiful because as products of timeless evolution, they are complete, integrated and self-sufficient entities. Their beauty arises from an evolutionary authority. Altogether, we should finally acknowledge that emotions and experiences of beauty are a domain of existential intelligence, implying a comprehensive judgment of the perceived phenomenon. Mark Johnson, philosopher, makes the significant remark, quote, there is no cognition without emotion even though we are often unaware of the emotional aspect of our thinking." Unquote. In his view, emotions are the source of primordial meaning. Quote, emotions are not second-rate cognitions, rather they are affective patterns of our encounter with our world by which we take the meaning of things at a primordial level." Unquote. Emotions unify ethical and aesthetic qualities and give them their lived existential meanings. Quote, it is only with the heart that one can see right. What is essential is invisible to the eye. Uh, end of quote, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry asserts. In his book, 
intelligence reframed. Psychologist Howard Gardner identifies 10 ca categories of intelligence beyond the characteristic, uh, characteristics measured by the standard IQ, IQ test. And these are the in, 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 in intelligence categories of Gardner. Linguistic, logical, mathematical, musical, bodily kinesthetic, spatial, interpersonal and intrapersonal, naturalistic, ethical, and spiritual intelligences. Based on my personal experiences and intuition, I wish to add four further categories, aesthetic, emotional, atmospheric, and existential intelligences to this already thought-provoking list of the psychologists. It is evident that even in the creative fields and their education, the complexities of human intelligence embodied and emotional capacities and the essences of the phenomena of beauty and ethical judgment are hardly understood, not to speak of the complex and uncon unconscious nature of creative processes. The poetic and artistic reality of a work of art is not in the material and physical object, but in its internalization through individual experience. Beauty has to be experienced and felt. This is the seminal view of John Dewey, the American philosopher, in his book, Art as Experience of, of 1934 where he writes, quote, in common conception, the work of art is often identified with the building, book, painting, or statue in its, in its existence apart from human experience. Since the actual work of art is what the product does with and in, in experience, the result is not favorable to understanding. When artistic objects are separated from both conditions of origin and operation in experience, a wall is built around them that renders almost opaque the uh, general significance with which aesthetic theory deals. End of quote. Art articulates and expresses the world of lived experiences, and it mediates the human mental essence of these very encounters. A true artist is not de depicting an isolated detail or aspect of the world. Every real artistic work is a microcosm, a complete world of its own, or in the words of Andrei Tarkovsky, the film director, quote, the whole world as reflected in a drop of water, unquote. Every true work of art projects an entire world. I wish to argue firmly that art is not merely aestheticization, as it is a form of genuine thinking about the world and our being in that very world. Through embodied and poeticized images and means characteristic to the art form in question. Quote, how would the poet or the painter express anything other 
than his encounter with the world. End of quote. Maurice Merleau-Ponty asks, pointing out the existential focus of art. How could the architect express anything else? We need to ask accordingly. Similarly, like Dewey, Merleau-Ponty does not regard the material of performed work itself as the objective of art. Quote, we come not to see the work of art, but the world according to the work, end of quote, he states. This idea has become very important uh, in my thinking, so I'll repeat it. We come not to see the work of art, but the world according to the work. And this was uh, Ponty. This view turns art into a mediating act. It tells primarily of something else than of itself. The meaning of art is behind, behind and beyond the work itself. This position also rejects the common idea of art as the artist's self-expression. Indeed, art is a relational medium which tells us about the essences of the lived world, or perhaps more precisely, about being a human in this world. Bautus, uh, whose correct proper name was Balthasar Trosovsky de Rola, one of the finest realist painters of last century, points out the significance of the world as the artist's true subject. Quote, if a work only expresses the person who created it, it wasn't worth doing. Expressing the world, understanding it, that is what seems interesting to me. End of quote. In another context, the painter articulates his position further. Quote, great painting has to have universal meaning. This is no longer so, uh, this is no longer so today, and that is why I want to give painting back its lost universality and anonymity. Because the more anonymous a painting is, the more real it is, unquote. This is a thought-provoking argument against the understanding of art as self-expression or aestheticization. And the next um, chapter title, Art and its Past. Here again, the ethical perspective enters the domain of art and architecture. Like all art, the art of building is simultaneously about the lived world and the layered his histories and meanings of the art form itself. All arts carry their timeless traditions along the route towards the future. Meaningful works are conversations across time, and truly radical works open up new ways of reading and experiencing works of history. Just think of how Picasso, for instance, has opened our eyes to see the 25,000 years old cave paintings. As Aldo van Eyck, the Dutch structuralist architect, who introduced anthropological thinking in today's architecture, was asked to give his inaugural lecture at the University of Delft on Giotto's influence on Paul Cezanne. Van Eyck refused and instead gave the lecture on Cezanne's influence on Giotto. 
all great artists, uh, artists reveal the existential essence of art. As a consequence of this multiple perspective, also architecture needs to have a double focus, the lived world and the mythical traditions of constructing. The highly refined technologies of today tend to weaken the deep unconscious meanings and hidden mythical subconscious meanings of building, which are echoed in all great architectural works. All meaningful works are timeless and they are all always simultaneously about the past, present and future. Quote, an artist is worth a thousand centuries. Unquote, Paul Valéry, the poet, courageously suggests. The aesthetic reality has also been extended to biological phenomena. It is well known that certain selective criteria that could be regarded as aesthetic choices, such as symmetry and signs of health and strength, are essential factors in mate selection among animals. Certain aesthetic here, the word aesthetic is in parenthesis. Uh, certain aesthetic ge uh, gestures, rituals, and deliberate constructions are also used to attract a mate, such as the silk balloon of the balloon flame uh, fly, the huge staged and decorated nests of the bowerbirds, and the coordinated group singing and dancing by male blue manatees. The recent book entitled The Evolution of Beauty by Richard O. Prum reintroduces Charles Darwin's second book on evolution entitled The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, published in 1871. Uh, 13 years after he celebrated on the origin of spe species. Darwin published his second book after becoming convinced that the selective principles of his first theory could not explain all the variations among animal uh, species, including the proverbial case of the peacock's tail. In the Victorian era, uh, a book that suggested autonomous aesthetic choice for sexual purposes practiced by the female sex could not even be discussed. However, scientists have recently uh, shown through mathematical modeling that indeed the two theories of Darwin combined, combined fully explain all the variety among animal species, including the peacock's tail. Surprisingly, an individual aesthetic judgment is a principle of choice also in the animal world. The notion of biophilia, which is uh, referred to as, quote, the science and ethics of life, unquote, introduced and articulated by the biologist Edward O. Wilson, expands the human ethical responsibility beyond the realm of human interaction all the way to our duty in maintaining biodiversity. Zemir Tseki, a pioneering neurobiologist, also connects aesthetics with biological evolution as he suggests the feasibility of, 
quote, a theory of aesthetics that is biologically based, unquote. In his book, Inner Vision, an exploration of art and the brain. With the intuition and courage of a poet, Joseph Brodsky supports the scientist's view when he writes, quote, the purpose of evolution, believe it or not, is beauty, which survives it all and generates truth simply by being a fusion of the mental and the sensual. We have an amazing unconscious capacity to identify ourselves with other living creatures and even with objects and phenomena of our perceptions, such as human and spatial situations, and to project ourselves and emotions onto them. Quote, be like me, unquote, is the imperative of the poem in, jo uh, in Joseph Brodsky, Brodsky's view. Somewhat unexpectedly, empathy is a capacity that also animals possess. As Franz Deval's book, The Age of Empathy, argues. The recent research on the chemical communication and collaboration of plants and trees extends the realm of purposeful communication far beyond our own mental worlds. This research on the communication of plants identified, uh, identified 800 chemical words and even traced local, local dialects. We even simulate the individual characters of great novels and momentarily share their fates, lives, life situations and emotions. Experiencing a work of art is an exchange. The work lends us its authority and magic and we lend the work our emotions. Neuroscience has associated this act of unconscious mirroring and change <coughs> with our mirror neurons. The great ethical value and human equality of art is that we are able to experience our emotions mirrored by the most profound and sensitive minds in human history. We do not only reflect the thoughts, feelings, and experiences of the living, as our empathic imagination can also bring the dead back to life. We can sense through the skin, muscle, muscles, and emotions of Michelangelo. See through the eyes of Piero della Francesca. Hear through the ears of Johann Sebastian Bach. And feel through the heart of Rainer Maria Rilke. As the poet suggests in the motto of my essay, Art and beauty are not only adjectives, they constitute the very core of human, humane and dignita, dignified life. And I come to my very last chapter. Beauty is a synthetic and integrated character and quality of a phenomenon akin to the human ethical quality of integrity. The notion of integrity also refers to the singularity, inner cohesion, coherence, and autom autonomy of a thing, behavior, or phenomenon. In 1954, at the age of 85, Frank Lloyd Wright formulated the mental task of architecture following, quote, what is needed most in architecture today is the very thing that is most needed 
in life, integrity. Just as it is in a human being, so integrity is the deepest quality in a building. If we succeed, we will have done a great service to our moral nature, the psyche of our democratic society. Stand up for integrity in your building and you stand for integrity, not only in the life of those who did the buildings, but socially a reciprocal relationship is inevitable." Unquote. And thank you for your attention.